Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling podcast. <laughs> oh, no, give me a break. Oh, brother. the inspiration you bring feeling to my life you're the inspiration i want to thank chicago for writing that god awful song about their favorite podcast stick to wrestling where if you give us 60 minutes perhaps indeed we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast this podcast is the recognized symbol of excellence in podcast entertainment Before we get rolling with part two of the WWF fall of 1982, I want to invite you to join our Facebook group. We talk a lot about wrestling, but we also talk about a lot of other things like me painting and redecorating the office that Stick to Wrestling emanates from. Uh, Also, if you want to follow me on Twitter, just search John McAdam and follow the guy with the Stick to Wrestling logo as his avatar. I've only got like 1,300 followers. I need a lot more, man. Please follow me. And uh, yeah, this is... Oh, and if you want to donate to this podcast, which is ad-free... Everything free. You can just listen to it. Uh, you can donate to Pro Wrestling Archives at gmail.com via PayPal. I want to thank David Ferguson for his generous donation to the show. I did not even gloat about Tennessee beating Alabama, and I'm not going to do so now. <laughs> Welcome to part two of WWF 1982 with Jamie Ward. Let's get rolling on that. All right, I'll tell you what, let's get a little bit caught up on the audio we have. We have the Buddy Rogers Corner from the week after Jimmy Snook had been uh, re- had received the pile driver from Ray Stevens. He is wearing a neck brace that's practically up to his eyebrows and down to the middle of his chest. He's got a giant bandage on his forehead. Uh, obviously, I don't have the video, but we have the audio for review purposes. Let's go to that. I'd like to state that the views expressed in Rogers Corner are those of Mr. Rogers solely, alone, and not necessarily those of All-Star Wrestling or this station. And boy, are we ever looking forward to this. We now take you, ladies and gentlemen, to Buddy Rogers and the Superfly. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Rogers Corner. I believe at this moment, for me to say we've got the greatest news there is by looking at Jimmy Snuka. Perhaps don't fit right in, but let me tell you something. Jimmy Snooker will be back. Jimmy Snooker did not receive a broken neck. And due to the fact to the super superb build that Jimmy has, the doctor said that his neck could withstand this pounding. But I would like to say that when it comes to Jimmy Snooker, I took, as of this moment, I have taken his offer, and I deem it one of the greatest privileges I've ever had, and that is to announce that I am, as as of now, Jimmy's new manager. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. Jimmy and I, we know what the word fidelity is. Jimmy and I will never have a contract. We don't need contracts. Every dime that Jimmy ever makes is going to be Jimmy's, and I guarantee you, I don't want a penny of it. Jimmy, let these folks hear just the way you feel. You know, buddy, there's only one thing I'd just like to mention to the people out here, that I'm glad that the doctor told me that I had nothing very serious with my neck but the most important thing that I just like to mention to the people out there in the TV Wonderland is that buddy I appreciate this and this couldn't be any moment that I could ever need anybody else but you buddy Rogers Thank you. and now ladies and gentlemen let's go back to the ringside well, Buddy knows what the word fidelity is, but he does not know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I want to go to one more clip of Buddy Rogers' corner from the next week. Let's go to that. 
Welcome to Rogers Corner, ladies and gentlemen. I believe I have the greatest news for you that's ever been reported in the history of wrestling. Let me tell you right now that there's one thing nobody knew about, and I'm going to let you know what it is. Ladies and gentlemen, two weeks before that brutal beating that Jimmy Snuka took at ringside was planned by Lou Albano, Fred Blassie, and Ray the Crippler Stevens. Let me tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. Ray the Crippler Stevens is half owned by Lou Albano. He bought 50% of his contract. And long before that challenge match, they knew what was going to happen. That's why in what few seconds you've seen, everything happened so fast, none of us knew what really went down. But now today we do know that Lou Albano once again just cut the throat of Jimmy Snuka and done him in again. Well, let me tell you something. That's the bad side. The good side is all the things they thought they were going to do to Jimmy didn't happen. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Snuka did survive. Jimmy Snuka is coming around. The, the stitches are removed. But let me tell you another thing. Payday will be around, and it isn't too far. One other thing I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy, perhaps by next week, the neck brace will come off. And I guarantee you, the fur will fly when he comes back. I want to thank each and every one of you for sticking behind Jimmy the way you did. And Jimmy will also feel the same as I do. Thank you very much. Let's go back to ringside. Jamie, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, I remember when Morocco came back, especially Morocco, but the Samoans, the Samoans had been gone for, I, if I recall correctly, less than two years. Morocco hadn't even been gone for a year. I remember feeling like, you know, they, they it's not that they came back too soon, but they came back too soon for my taste. I'll agree with that. And it, it's a pattern that actually continues. Yes. As we go along with, with some other talent. And uh, I mean, hey, we're only two, we're less than two years away from Black Saturday and the national expansion. Uh, that, yeah, uh, you're right. And, you know, the wrestling business was going to change dramatically. And to allude to what, what Jamie had just said, uh, I mean, Sl Sergeant Slaughter came right back after this. George the Animal Steel had been gone less than two years when he came back in 1983. I felt like even though, you know, Slaughter was great, Morocco was great, 1983 to me felt like in, in a lot of ways the WWF was in reruns. Well, and they also bring, you know, Koloff back. Yeah, Koloff had been gone for a while, though. Like that one I could live with. But the other guy. Yeah, he was about about three and three and a half years at that point. Um, Let me see. He left middle of middle of 79 so it had been, it'd been about four years I, I was fine with that all right i thought he made it to 80 but all right if he left in the middle then because he doesn't show up until around march or so yeah bad example we have no no it's still it, it, it's someone that you know we've had he before he just you know had been gone long enough again for me <laughs> actually not to, can i just add one more th yeah thing to the, the jimmy snook uh that entire angle that's what you're here for that is you know, looking back now, 40 years ago, that is probably Vince's greatest angle that he came up with was the whole Jimmy Snuka babyface turn. I mean, w with that, the week after the, the angle with the pile driver, Vince pulls one out of his father's old hat. And it, you remember after Bruno gets attacked by Zabisco, a week or two later, they do the empty arena interview with Bruno just sitting there with Vince, you know, looking directly into the camera, just very even keel. And then the emotion builds up and builds up. They did the same exact thing with Snuka 
in the empty Allentown Fairgrounds, and then where it, you know he's all bandaged up, he has the, the neck brace, and he starts real slow, real slow, and then he gets all pumped up, and then he comes back down, and that's the first time that he ever mentions the um, that hand sign that he used meant "I love you." Yeah, that was uh, another one that I don't have and could not find, but that's a really good point on your part. But if anybody out there can find that on YouTube, it, it's definitely worth watching. I had a tough – I tried looking for it. I couldn't find it. I, I know it's out there because I saw – I remember watching it, and it's so vivid to me that it's jumping out. So, all right, go ahead and continue. I didn't mean to jump back no, on that's, you. That's, it, that's just that's, something I wanted to, to, to get out there. No, that's, that's what you're here for, and, and thank you for that because I would have forgotten about it even though I looked for it and couldn't find it. Another – Big development happens in the World Wrestling Federation. A newcomer under this name, he'd been in the WWF before uh, as Chuck O'Connor and as Executioner Number 2, but we'd never seen him as Big John Stud. He'd completely changed his appearance from the Chuck O'Connor days. I had no idea he'd been in the WWF before. And he is managed by Fred Blassie as soon as we... And another Georgia guy. Um, he, he, you're yeah. right. He hadn't been in Georgia. He's he just coming off the run with Super Destroyer as the, uh, as their tag champs uh, up through what, July? Ah, uh, that's not around right. there when the Freebirds beat him, right, right, right around there. So Stud's pretty fresh off the Georgia television. Yeah, he, as a matter of fact, I never thought of that before. I, I did think of Morocco and the Samoans, but not Stud. But you're right. He had recently been on, on WTBS. Stud has Fred Blassie as his manager, and as soon as I see this, I'm like, okay, they finally were smart enough to bring in a guy who, A, could have a credible series against Bob Backlund, and B, the next step is the obvious feud with Andre the Giant. Yep, absolutely, and that's, how many years did they get that to last? Five years? Four years. 83 right up until WrestleMania two. Right around there, That's- if if not a little longer. Um, Andre got suspended in uh, the the spring of 1986, and that's kind of when that feud ended. Okay, right, it, it, up through 86 then. But yes, yeah, Stud was the uh, a holdover from the from before the national expansion. Um, you know when when they went to a new city in 1984, usually the main event was either Hulk Hogan versus Big John Stud or Andre the Giant against Big John Stud. So this is a big pickup for the WWF. Right, he he had a uh, a, a second life because that, actually he probably leaves in the beginning of 84 or moves down the card. You don't see him that often. And he comes back as Ventura's uh, replacement in that August 84 match at uh, Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Where they debut Bobby Heenan. The debut of Bobby Heenan. And my goodness, Jesse Ventura is in such poor health that he misses a Madison Square Garden main event, which was unheard of. But if you've got a blood clot in your lung, you do what the doctor says. Yeah, well, you know what? We're going to have a lot of fun doing this in another two years when we get to 1984. <laughs> well, actually, Jamie, this I, I have got kind of a uh, something up my sleeve for 1984. Oh, okay. I, I can't release that information yet. But anyway, <laughs> um, Kurt Henning, let's go to Madison Square Garden, November 22nd, 1982. It's a sellout, of course. Uh, we have an interesting opener, uh, Kurt Henning and Eddie Gilbert both up-and-coming wrestlers who had big careers in front of them wrestling to a 20-minute draw. Uh, yeah, it was very interesting. They actually did that around the horn a few times with Hennig and, uh, and Gilbert going to a draw. Yeah, they were, and they were wrestling as tag team partners on TV. Yes, they were, and you know they were definitely undercard guys at this time. I mean, I, I didn't look at them and say, "Oh, wow, you know, Eddie Gilbert's going to be one of your favorite wrestlers in about five years." Oh, Kurt Henning is going to be a major contender. He, um, he's going to be the AWA champion. Yeah, I never, even though I enjoyed Kurt, and you know he was good in every single match. I never thought he was going to become Mr. Perfect. 
No, as a matter of fact, you know, one or, of the, or that level. One of the cool things about Kurt Henning was watching him go up the up the ladder. Like, okay, you know, now he's a mid card guy in the AWA. Oh, now he's the AWA Tag Team Champion. Now he's having great matches with Nick Bockwinkel. Now he's the AWA Champion. It, it, it was fun for me to watch. And he was probably the last guy that progressed in that manner. Yeah, either everyone gets it. Right I mean, we don't really have to think about it, but he it, he might be the last one that ever uh, progressed like that. I mean, he did his time in uh, with Don Owen out in the Northwest, where he got his first semi push and back to the, the AWA, and that, and then the AWA he graduates, and then finally back to the WWF again. Yeah, I mean, Kurt Henning, you know, it was one of those things where, I mean, we're not talking about fall of 82 for a minute. To me, he always felt like more of a JCP guy than a, than a WWF guy, and that's not how it ended up. Oh, that would have been great at the time had he gone there. Yeah. Okay, so SD Jones defeats Sweet Hansen by disqualification. Sweet Hansen, three years earlier, not even three years earlier, in the main event against Bob Backlund and MSG, and now he's losing a match to SD Jones. Yeah, Sweet is uh, on his way down. He is, uh, even after the big angle where, even after the big angle with superstar Billy Graham, a phenomenon in the WWF occurs as Tiger Mask appears at Madison Square Garden and wrestles Jose Estrada. Jamie, I had never seen anything even a little bit like Tiger Mask before. Oh, no. I mean, we were fortunate enough to have seen him in August against Dynamite Kid and had no idea he was going to come back in November and actually appear on several cards. Uh, looking back at the results here, here in Wilmington, Delaware, he on November 18th, he went up against uh, Kurt Hennig. And then November 19th, he's wrestling Eddie Gilbert. Yeah, I, I wish he had come up here, but he didn't. Yeah, well, we end up, I mean, we're going to cover it in a few minutes. I mean, uh, he's also at the uh, Spectrum where he wrestles Eddie Gilbert. And years later, when I got to know Eddie, I asked him about that match. And he said it was one of the easiest matches he ever had because the guy was like a feather. That that does not surprise me. All right, then we have at Madison Square Garden, Bob Backlund and superstar Billy Graham going to a double disqualification. So we're doing three matches with superstar at Madison Square Garden. Uh, I mean, you know, again, we went over this. Superstar Billy Graham was huge in New York. Yeah, well, I mean, they sold the show out again and the felt form. So the, the, even though he was Kung Fu Billy Graham... He was still Billy, superstar Billy Graham in New York. Exactly. Uh, Salvatore Palomo defeats Mr. Fuji by DQ. Uh, Salvatore Palomo, you know, he, I was never a big fan of his. I mean, he was a good carpenter, but he actually got a really good uh, reception in New York. I was a, I watched this show pretty recently, and they liked him. Yeah, fans across the board liked uh, Palomo. It wasn't until after he was around for a year or so did he... Um, he started to wear down on the fans and wasn't as popular as he was. No, he was, and, but you know, give him credit. He was in the WWF. I mean, he showed up in 1982 and he was still around in 1987. I mean, that's a, that's a good run. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and matter of fact, guys like Pedro were even still around through 87. Um, and Putski. Eh, exactly. Even though not on TV, they were still appearing on house shows, especially in the, on the East Coast. Yeah, they, they both went on hiatus for a while. I remember when Pedro Morales came back, uh, he left uh, beginning of 83, then he came back in 1985, and they introduce him in Madison Square Garden in 85 while Morocco was in the ring waiting to wrestle, and I, they definitely did that on purpose. Oh, yeah. I mean, spinning off their long-term feud. And then we have, um, let me see, Pedro Morales pins Buddy Rose at 11.29. Uh, Buddy Rose, you know, had it going on in the WWF. What a, a great in-ring performer. And as we found out the last time we did this, Buddy was great on the stick. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Buddy has a nice long run. He, he shows up well, back in April and... Uh, going over results he was still making some shots into early march yes he was he was at he was still in boston in you know early 83 yeah so he, he had a good run they must have liked buddy again he did get several more shots even though he uh 
he never lasted. No, he didn't. But, you know, Buddy, I mean, like I said, great perf- great in-ring performer, just didn't really have the WWF look. I thought they rushed this a little bit. Jimmy Snuka defeats Captain Lou Albano when the referee stops the match for blood. If I were booking this at Madison Square Garden, Jamie, I would have started with either a traditional tag team match, Jimmy Snuka and, I don't know, Rocky Johnson or Buddy Rogers, but I wouldn't have done that right away against, like, Lou Albano and one of his charges, maybe Albano, Saito, and and Fuji against Pedro and two of the baby faces where Albano keeps running away from from Snuka, but that's not what they did, and what can I say? They were successful anyway. I should should never second-guess these guys. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing what they figured with New York, that the money was going to be in Snuka-Stevens. So you get, and, and matter of fact, uh, going over the results, they did a, uh, quite a few shows with Snuka Albano first before they got to Snuka and Stevens. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I should have said they should have had Albano and Stevens in the tag match. But you know what? The more I think about that, now you're taking away from the Snuka Stevens single match. All right. Uh, Ray Stevens, speaking of whom, defeats Chief Chase Strombo in, in, in 62 seconds with a pile driver. And Snuka is taken out. Snuka Strongbo is taken out on a stretcher. The end of Chief J. Strongbo's career is, is we're, on that, and it's not a pretty thing to watch. And once again, the disrespect for the tag team champions that one of the champions does the job. Exactly. I mean, they. I mean, it happened with happened with everybody. Yeah, they they did that with the baby, and actually, they did that with the heels too. Then we have more New Japan guys: Ricky Choshu and Mister Saito against losing to Rocky Johnson and Tony Gurria. Um, back in the day. The New Japan guys coming to Madison Square Garden, I have been told, was the equivalent of wrestling on a WrestleMania. Oh, yeah. It was big time for uh, Japan to come over here. Yeah, and, and shows. I mean, he, even Anoki makes it to, like, early 84 before, they, you know, they have the phone out. Um, you know, the, the Cobra appears in early 84. I actually think Anoki won, uh, Anoki won a Battle Royal December... 84 in Madison Square Garden, and, and I think the Cobra was okay. like March 85. But you're right. I mean, that that wasn't quite sputtering out yet. Right, exactly. So th- th- they were still getting along at that point. All right, before we go on to the next uh, show, let's hear a Buddy Rogers Corner featuring a new star to the WWF, one Rocky Johnson. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Rogers Corner. My guest is Rocky Johnson, one of the finest athletes in the wrestling game today. Believe me, he possesses a superb body, a dynamite personality, and has a ton of ability. I understand Rocky's had eight years of amateur and I guess quite a few years of professional. And another thing I'd like to thank Rocky, I owe a lot to Rocky, He helped me get Jimmy Snooker right back to where we want him. So, Rocky, I know there's some things you'd like to say. First of all, I just want to say it's a real pleasure being here, a pleasure and an honor. And first, Snooker. Snooker's a very good friend of mine. I did help get him back together mentally, physically, but I think mentally you're the man. I have to give you all the credit for that, buddy, because you did a fantastic job with him. You got him back right where we want him, and I feel that Jimmy and you, you're going to go a long, long way. Thank you. Listen, I know there's something that the people don't know, and that is that you've had some real boxing ability. Well, yes, I uh, I fought amateur. I fought 160 uh 168 amateur fights. I fought 44 professional. I've had the pleasure of sparring with uh, Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, heavyweights like that in my career. Thank you, Rocky. What I'd like to do right now, ladies and gentlemen, is take you back to live wrestling at ringside. All right, Rocky Johnson inexplicably had 160-something amateur fights, and we're still talking about Jimmy Snooker, even though he's not there. Right, because they're putting Snooker over how he's... He's getting back, you know, from all the injuries and Snook is ready to get his revenge on Albano and Stevens. But you, you notice they never bring up Lassie in that. No. 
he just skates free in this <laughs> in this whole scenario. Yeah, really. They're they're keeping all the heat on Lou Albano. Now we're going to talk about a show. We're going to talk about two shows, one that Jamie went to and then one that I went to. Let's start with the one Jamie went to, November 25th, 1982, with the Philadelphia Spectrum. The big match of the main event is Bob Backlund versus Playboy Buddy Rose. Uh, it's a lumberjack match, and we have S.D. Jones as the guest referee. Uh, Jamie, what do you remember about this show? Well, what I remember is it was a Thanksgiving night, 1982. And as soon as I got finished watching the, uh, I wasn't even finished watching the, the Spectrum show from October, they announced that they were coming for Thanksgiving night. I ran down the steps and said, Dad, please, can we, on Thanksgiving night, can we go to the Spectrum and see wrestling? There's everywhere else in the country, there's wrestling on Thanksgiving night. Can we go? He said yes. And the next morning, we drove down to the, uh, the Spectrum box office and bought tickets for the show. Nice memory. I like that. I mean, we talked, I think it was you were the, the last time you were the guest, we were talking about wrestling on holidays. And I mean, if they had a show at the Boston Garden, I would have been so conflicted because there's so much to do on Thanksgiving night. No, there is. But you no, know, I was head over heels in the wrestling at this point. And my dad would do anything, you know, for me. And it was my dad went to wrestling with me all the way up through like 1989. That's it. That's really good. Yeah, we'd go to the we we went to basically every Civic Center or NWA Civic Center show from eighty five when it started up through eighty nine. Excellent. All right. So you also now you got to see a treat. Uh, one of the matches with Pedro Morales and Salvatore Belomo against Mister Saido and Ricky Choshu. Ricky Choshu, you know, a, a, a no questions asked Hall of Famer, and you got to see him live. And I got to see Salvatore Belomo. Pin uh, Choshu. Now, I remember reading in the magazines that Mr. Saito had this new Japanese partner. At the time, I had no idea who he was. Um, I mean, you know, did you kind of have a, okay, who is this guy? What's going on? Where's Mr. Fuji kind of outlook? Well, no, I figured they were just breaking up the team at that point since they had lost the belts. So we're almost two months after they've lost the titles at this point. And, um, you know, I had read Choshu's name in the uh, old wrestling news magazines. And so I kind of knew who he was. And I, I just figured they were just bringing him over here, um, you know, for the publicity. I mean, he had just I just saw him wrestle on the Garden Show in the same situation. Uh, I figured Morales and Belomo were going to win. Yeah, I, I would have figured the same thing. You, you kind of knew Saito was on his way out. And here's a guy, Ricky Choshu, that, you know, I... I Really, I, I'm sure I read the name in one of the Kiter magazines, but it never registered. I mean, you kind of know who's going over here. Yeah, exactly. All right. You guys got an extra Thanksgiving treat because you did get to see Jimmy Snuka and Buddy Rogers versus Captain Lou Albano and Ray Stevens when Snuka pins Albano with the splash from the top of, from the top rope. Yep. And, and, and Rogers looked phenomenal. You, you didn't ever know. I guess he was well into his 60s at this point. but. The guy looked great, and he could actually still move in the ring. Yeah, I have seen this. On, I haven't seen this in a while. I have it on tape somewhere, but I do remember being impressed by how great shape uh, Buddy Rogers was in. And I saw Rogers in 1991 at a convention, and for a guy his age, he looked fantastic. Yeah, he did. And, I mean, this is far from a, like a five-star match or anything, but, I mean, sitting there live getting to see – I mean, I got to see Bruno, but getting to see Buddy Rogers, another living legend, who I would have never thought I'd ever had the opportunity to see wrestle, actually wrestle. It, it was a great part of my wrestling fandom early in my life. You know, here I am. Oh, man, you got to see Ricky Choshu live. I'm just like, and I kind of gloss over, you know, it, it's only Buddy Rogers, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. <laughs> All right, and then on December the 4th, 1982, WWF returns to the Boston Garden. Of course, I went. Main matches are former Portland guys. Uh, Rocky Johnson defeats Buddy Rose by DQ. Jimmy Snuka defeats Captain Lou Albano by countout. Three minutes and 25 seconds of the match had barely gotten started when Albano juices and runs to the dressing room. I remember feeling a bit unsatisfied by that, but... The fans loved it, Jamie. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, any time Albano got his, the fans were into it. I, every single time. And they, they knew to only do it like every three years or so. And we hadn't seen it since Pat Patterson did it to Albano. Coming off the last show, superstar Billy Graham defeats former referee Ivan Putski, five minutes and 25 seconds. And then there was a memorable main event. Bob Backlund uh, defeats Ray Stevens via countout. Stevens was going to pile drive Backlund uh, outside the, not outside the ring, on the apron. Bob Backlund just catapults over, gets back in the ring as the referee counts 10. I remember this match because, A, generally speaking, the Boston Garden just, you know, yeah, weird finish, that's okay. The fans seemed not to like that finish. I didn't like it either. And secondly, you know, people, Ray Stevens, a legendary worker. Bob Backlund could work still in 1982. Jamie, I, I I think I've you've been on the show. I'm like you know I probably remember like five percent of the matches as being very good or very bad. This was a very bad match. Um, that's surprising considering the two guys that were in it. Yeah, I mean you would think that Ray- even though Stevens is winding down at this point, Backlund could still go. No, he he could when he wanted to. Bob was taking kind of taking a step back or was about to. But you would think Ray Stevens would want to have a, a good match in in Boston. You know, he'd been in the WWF before. But yeah, this match stunk on ice, man. Well, can't be hot every night. Nah, you're you're a hundred percent right. Now we will talk a little bit about TV. Eddie Gilbert is now we have a Buddy Rogers where. Buddy Rogers Corner, where Eddie Gilbert is announced as Bob Backlund's new protege. Uh, can we go to that, please? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Gives me great pleasure to introduce my guest, a fella to my right, coming from a long line of wrestlers in the family, grandfather, father, and down to Eddie, Eddie Gilbert. And to my uh, left, none other than the outstanding manager of the Worldwide Wrestling Federation champion, Arnie Skolan. And without a doubt, the greatest champion, Bob Backlund. Welcome, fellas. Bob, I understand that you've taken a very particular interest in the fellow alongside of me, and I know you'd like to tell the folks about him. Yeah, Ed Gilbert is uh, a man that I really, really respect. Uh, he's got a great, great background in amateur wrestling, and his family's been in uh, professional wrestling for a really, really long time. And uh, Arnold Skoll and myself really think that he's got a heck of a future in professional wrestling. And uh, uh, we've had some opportunities to work out with him and uh, train with him. And boy, he's a dedicated young man. And uh, by golly, uh, we're going to try to do all we can do to help this man get ahead in professional wrestling. And Ed, uh, you know, we're, I know you're a hard man. You're a hard man to beat, and uh, uh, I think we can, you know, climb to the top. Uh, Mr. Rogers, I would like to publicly thank Mr. Skolan and Bob for taking the interest in me, and also, Bob, the long hours and the sweat that you put into me, and it's just a great honor, and I'm going to give 150% every time I step in the ring. Thank you very much. Well, the big surprise is next week, ladies and gentlemen, these two fellas will be in a ring as a tag team. It'll be real super to watch and see what happens. With that, we'll go back to ringside wrestling. Jamie, I don't know if you remember what your reaction was when you first saw this. And once maybe I had been watching wrestling too long and, you know, knew what was going to happen next, but I'm like, okay. How long is it going to take for one of the heels to absolutely splatter this Eddie Gilbert guy? Yeah, once again, this was a Stevie Wonder moment. I hate to keep picking on Stevie, but um, you knew somebody was going to get their hands on Gilbert. You absolutely knew like what this was going to lead to, and it eventually came around. And, and you know what? From a visual standpoint, Eddie looked like a little kid sitting in that chair. He did. Because he wasn't sitting upright. Nobody told Eddie to, to, to sit upright in, in the chair. Instead, he was all like all slouched and everything. And you, you would think back on uh, of anybody, you know, since he used to make people recite the uh, all the presidents in order to get his autograph. You, you think that, you know, they would he would have said, yo, Eddie, 
you know, straighten up in the seat or something, just, just for that um, that visual. Yeah, would look better. I mean, the director so that it showed showed that he cared. Instead, he was just sitting there, for lack of a better term, a country bumpkin just sitting there in a chair, <laughs> you know, all slats down. It, it, it's so true, though. I mean, you know, you you got to the director should have stepped in and said, "Hey, you know, Eddie, you got to sit up, man." I mean, I would have been excited as hell, Bob Back on going to take me under his wing. Yeah, it, it, it hardly had any emotion at all. Well, it didn't take long. Jamie, you might have it in front of you. Of course, we not long thereafter, we have a Big John Stud versus Eddie Gilbert match that ends with yes. Backlund getting hit from behind with Fred Blassie's cane. When did they air that? Do you know? I'm not quite sure when it aired. I don't, it probably, let's say, Madison Square Garden, Stud gets a shot. So I would imagine it, it airs sometime in December, early January. Yeah, so they did not waste any time at all, you know, having shooting that angle where Eddie Gilbert gets beaten up by Big John Studd and Bob Backlund tries to save the day and he winds up getting splattered, leaving, you know, leading up to a big show. Speaking of Big John Studd, we have more audio from Buddy Rogers Corner where he speaks with Fred Blassie and Big John Studd. Uh, once again, for review and educational purposes only, here's that. At Rogers Corner. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My guest today is the infamous Fred Blassie, manager of Big John Stud. Big John Stud weighs well over 350 pounds. And today, ladies and gentlemen, in all my career of wrestling, I never heard of a challenge made like this. Now, hear this. Any man can absolutely pick John up over their head and slam him will receive $500. This $500 is held by Fred Blassie. Now each and every time that someone can't slam him, they will raise it 500 more. Now I would like to say, has anyone ever slammed you? Nobody's ever slammed John Studd. I can't be slammed. I can't be pinned. I take steel bars and steel bolts and I bend them with my bare hands. And my great manager, the Fred Blassie, said, Stud, it's the time. The World Rally Wrestling Federation's ready for you. And Fred, I'm ready for you. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Go back to ringside for live wrestling. Thank you. Jamie, I have always thought that when it comes to pro wrestling and money, it, it doesn't it usually doesn't mix well. At in mid Atlantic in the Mid Atlantic Territory, you had Dory Funk Jr. offering, and this was so preposterous, one hundred thousand dollars to anyone who could defeat him. Right? I mean, it's it's so preposterous, and we all know he's lost matches before. On the other end of the spectrum. We have John Studd offering five hundred dollars for anyone who could slam him. That's not even going to pay the rent for this, for this month. Yeah, that was a big spender to start with. But I don't know if, if you caught it. I did. S supposedly they they were going to up it five hundred dollars every time. They did, and that's something else I wanted to address. In my own opinion. Don't make it complicated like that. Don't make these people do math. Just say it's ten. Right, just throw one amount out there. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's nitpicking, but that's what we do here. I just thought that was a, a little bit complicated, in my own opinion. Yeah, and you know, who the first guy was that uh, that they used to try to slam stud. You know who that guy was? What now? Was it someone quote unquote out of the audience? It was supposed to be somebody out of the audience, but the the guy they picked was a uh, independent guy. Who was it? King Kalua, also known as Mike Kalua, who wrestled the uh, Eastern Independence from like eighty one up through the nineties. At some point, I know Dennis used him quite a lot, and uh, he used the job on the AWA TV tapings when they were doing him at the the showboat. I remember that. I had no idea that was Mike Kalua. I remember Mike Kalua from Savoldi's promotion, like mid to late 80s. Right. That's the same as that guy. 
We, you taught me something today, Jamie. Thank you. That is, that's great information. Because it, it jumped right out at me because uh, around the same time, if the weather was correct, Bruno and Zabisco were, and Danucci were running that NWF that was being uh, filmed up around the Allentown area and it was on an Allentown independent station. And if the weather was correct, I could pick it up on my rabbit ears. Uh, it wasn't on the local cable, but I could pick it up on the rabbit ears. And Kalua worked for them. And then when I saw him trying to body slam uh, Stud, I knew exactly who he was. All right. And we, we got that show occasionally uh, on a, a really low-level UHF station in Boston. And they tried running here in Nashua, and they literally could not fill up the front rows of everything. I was all excited because I was getting yeah. my first ever front row seats for wrestling. And guess what? I didn't have to pay the extra money for them. There was like, I would say, 40 <laughs> people at this show. Yeah. Oh, real quick. Um, you asked me about when that Gilbert Stud match aired. Doing a little looking here. It aired on Christmas Day of eighty two. Okay, so they they didn't even wait a month. <laughs> uh unlay uh, no anyway. I mean, like I said, I, I saw it coming and it was coming. Uh, let me see. Let's talk about one of the shows they had in Baltimore. This is December 11th, 1982, and they're having the old winners of the Battle Royal wrestle the champion. Fuji and Saito had been – Mr. Fuji and Mr. Saito had been in the WWF since summer of 1981, so they are stale, and they were not even singles wrestlers, and they win the Battle Royal. And they decide to have, you know, Mr. Fuji go up against Bob Backlund. I don't know what the people of Baltimore did to deserve this. I would be, I would have been pissed had these guys who were clearly on their way out, or it looked like Mr. Fuji was on his way out, Saito was. This guy, he was now a middle of the card guy getting a shot at Backlund this late in the game. I could see a little Neely shock at probably throwing trash in the ring <laughs> when he sees those two guys. Uh, <laughs> win the battle royal. I, I, I don't understand that booking at all, um, unless they just pulled names out of a hat that night and said, "All right, the, the, the Fuji, you're getting the match tonight." That's the one thing I could figure. I I can't even imagine. I mean, you know, you've got superstar Billy Graham, Buddy Rose, other guys in this battle royal that would have been way better ch choices. Baltimore was treated to Jimmy Snuka and Rocky Johnson defeating the tag team of Ray Stevens and Captain Lou Albano. Of course, it's a count out. I'm guessing the heels ran away six minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah. And, you know, it makes sense that the, the Snuka... Uh, Johnson combination because if, if you uh, know what you know now with the whole Peter Maivia, uh Rocky Johnson connection uh, along with all the, the Polynesian wrestlers in general it, it, it makes sense to put Snuka and Johnson were uh, teaming up because they were probably real friends in real life. Yeah, it made sense to me because I, I believe it or not, I, I knew that they were both not at the same time, but they were both kind of Portland guys, if that makes sense. Yeah, it it does. All right. Uh, before we talk a little bit more about the what was going on in the WWF in 1982, let's do another Rogers Corner, this time with who I thought was going to be the next WWF champion, the Magnificent Morocco. We take you to the Buddy Rogers Corner. Before we do, we state that the views expressed in Rogers Corner are those of Mr. Rogers alone and not necessarily those of Championship Wrestling or this station. To Buddy Rogers we go. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My next guest is Magnificent Morocco. It's been a little while back, but I had an interview from a very top sportscaster. And he asked me who I thought at that time was the three best wrestlers in the world today. And you were one of them. Backlund was the other and Snuka was the other. So I would like to start off by saying welcome to Rogers Corner and I know you have some things to say. Well, first of all, it's very gracious of me taking time out of my very busy schedule to be here. As you know, I'm on many network television shows. I'm busy. I have a full itinerary. As 
far as your analyzation, as far as, the, as great wrestlers go, of course you have to say Bob Backlund would be one of the great wrestlers because he does have the World Heavyweight Championship. Of course you would have to say Magnificent Morocco is one of the great wrestlers in the world because as many times as he's defeated the world champion, as many times as he's humiliated the world champion, as many of the times as he's made fun of the world champion, that you know if a man's at the top and he has the man that can beat him, then obviously. But come on, Mr. Rogers. Come on. Two-time world champion, isn't that so? A man of many years, of many experience, of many matches, of many miles behind you. You, with all the wrestlers you've known, everybody you've seen, you say, you have the audacity to say that this Cro-Mangdon, uh, uh, imitating as a man, I've had it with, I, this is Morocco's corner here. Let me tell you what's going on. This is here. When you're the best, when you're number one in a whole wide world of professional wrestling, no matter whether it's Roger's Corner or it's Morocco's Corner, I come out here, I know what's going on. You, isn't it true that once before you collaborated with one Jimmy Snuka before, before Lou Albano, maybe you, maybe you had something to do with it. Lou Albano, hey, I'm, we're, we're finished with this. Let's take this, ma this match right back to the ring. All right, the ring side we go. Jamie, I actually remember at this point, I started rolling my eyes at that whole disclaimer thing. It was already nonsensical. But I still thought at this point Morocco was winning the title, and I was salivating over the idea of magnificent Morocco defending the title against the newly turned Jimmy Snuka. It felt like a dream match to me, and while the championship wasn't, or the, the the world championship wasn't involved, they did get around to what I thought was just an obvious match. Right, it, and that was a big time feud. But imagine if Morocco had been the world champ. Yeah, with those two going at that would have been a license to print money. They could have done probably four matches in Madison Square Garden. I mean, absolutely, you know, and it was just like Buddy Rogers were saying, you know, in my mind, we are looking at two elite top 10 in the world talent. Either one could be NWA champion uh, type wrestlers. Yeah, it just took for a while to uh, put the two of them together. But it, and even when they did finally get together, it, it was magic. It really the was. I mean, they waited for Morocco to get done with his feud with Backland, and then they brought it out for the summer of 83, and I'm pretty confident Jamie and I will be talking about that in about six months. So I'll tell you what. Now, that was, th th there's two interesting things from that Rogers corner, if, if anyone else picked up on it. Number one, there was no Lou Albano. It was just, just Morocco by himself, and Morocco was a little low-key for Morocco. And the other one was, the first time it's finally mentioned that Snuka and Rogers knew each other before. Exactly. I, I did pick up on that. I, I like how Morocco just, you know, he's calm, cool, and collected. Then all of a sudden he gets riled up, and then oh, I'll stop doing that now. <laughs> and, and he's the one that threw it to the ring. Yeah. Now, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know what? I know it's technically not fall 1982, this Madison Square Garden show. It's December 28th, so it's a week later, and we can do that. This will give you an idea of where Eddie Gilbert's push is going. He's in the opener against SD Jones that goes to a time limit draw. Yeah, I mean, they, they pumped it up and let it down. And it really doesn't come in, it doesn't come into play again that whole uh, Eddie Gilbert back on thing until the mass superstar angle a year later. Exactly. And this was right at, after Eddie's car wreck. Uh, let me see. Tony Gurria beats Johnny Rods. Buddy Rose defeats Ivan Putski by countout, which is a little bit surprised because usually once the heels lose to the champion in a city, they lose the rest of their matches. Yeah. And, but I'm just seeing here on December 26th, Buddy Rose is still getting title shots against Backlund in Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester. That is how it's pronounced, and that, that took me aback when I first moved up here. Not like the sauce, right? Just Worcester. Worcester, like W-O-O-S-T-E-R. 
Worcester. Okay. Yeah, I did. You know, and again, a lot as that was the WWS pattern. Um, the guys who got the shots, guys get shots at Madison Square Garden early, then Boston, Pittsburgh, a couple of months after that, and then the smaller building, the smaller towns like Worcester, two two months after that. No, you can't give the people in Worcester anything too special. And actually, there's something foreshadowing the future. There's an interesting tag team on this show. The Fabulous Mula and Wendy Richter. Oh, there, there, there might be a show coming With up. A year and a half later that. is, yeah, a year and a half later, that's big time. Yeah, getting off track a little bit. This is not fall 1982. Uh, they were still having Wendy Richter out wrestling as a heel after Cindy Lauper appeared on Piper's Pit in 1984. It was nuts. Yeah, and they also had her down in uh, Louisiana, too. Did, didn't uh, Watts use her for a little bit? Yeah, they did her. They did something with her uh, with a, in a, a mixed tag team with Buddy Landell, and then uh, Jim Cornette hired her to sucker Hacksaw Jim Duggan. That's right. And this was, again, right before her big baby face push. <laughs> Uh, anyway, hey Jamie, let, let me ask you. You're, you're looking at it now. Did that match in Worcester? Did it take place in the auditorium or at the Centrum? The auditorium. <laughs> okay. The, the Centrum was the big new building that all of the concerts moved from Boston Garden to the Worcester Centrum in fall 1982, and they never did well for wrestling. Number one, number two. I think the Worcester Auditorium may have been the single biggest dump I ever attended wrestling matches in. That place was horrible. Um, I know you're not. You didn't familiar. get to see the Philadelphia Civic Center before they redid it over. Oh, okay. I was going to say the Civic oh, Center wasn't that bad. <laughs> no, but it was when they first when NWA first went there. Uh, the paint was peeling off the walls, and I'm sure it was lead paint at the time yeah. and graffiti, and it, it was because it hadn't been used in a while. That's right. And I, they really didn't clean it up, but it was the only place they could get in. Well, I mean, hey, they had a nice run there. I mean, yeah, the NWA did well at the Philadelphia Civic Center for a while. Yeah, they did. All right. All right. Sorry to take you away from Madison Square Garden. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, Let me see. Pedro Morales goes to a double disqualification with uh, with Don Morocco. Uh, a little bit weird, a little bit out of order, because usually what the WWF did, they had the heel wrestle Backlund first, and then they went to the Intercontinental Championship. But then again, the way I'm looking at it, they're building up Pedro Morales as a challenger for Morocco. So here I am, 17 years old, with a vivid imagination. Yeah, well, Morocco's back for revenge. I mean, a year before, Pedro stole the belt from him. That is true. Well, they, they stole the belt from each other. Now we have <laughs> yeah. an interesting match because the uh, pin ma the, the match between Bob Backlund and superstar Billy Graham, it is a lumberjack match, and Swede Hansen, who is a heel still, is the special guest referee. This was the first time I am aware that they had a heel be the special guest referee. And Jamie, I don't, you got the WOR show, right? Yes. Okay. They did a really interesting buildup for this. They would build, bring in Swede Hansen, and Vince McMahon would say, Swede, are you going to call the match right down the line? And Hansen would just be like, I'm going to call the match my way. And he didn't elaborate as far as what that went. And it kind of made me, you know, look at it, look at it funny. I'm like, okay, what are they doing here? Are they going to put the title on superstar Billy Graham instead? It, it gave you that. I, I, I could see how you got that opinion from that. But by this point, especially on television, Swede was starting to get over with the fans, even though he was still, he's basically doing the uh, the heel jobber type role. But he was starting to get over with the fans and the, the fans were, you know, cheering him. So it, me personally, this was a, another Stevie Wonder moment for me. I, I kind of knew what was going to happen here. All right. I, I had no idea. I was thrown by the whole thing. And like I said, you know, he refused to say, oh, I'm going to call it right down the line. He's like, oh, I'll do whatever I want. All right. Uh, let me see. Jimmy Snooker defeats Ray Stevens via count out uh, six minutes and 50 seconds. Kind of a letdown to what seemed like should have been a, a bigger match, a bigger feud. 
I mean, without looking, I, I forget if they come back in January with that match or not. Uh, I don't think they did. I, th- I think they just had the, the Big John stud match. And finally, once again, we have Chief J and Jules Strongbow versus Mr. Fuji and Mr. Saito. By this point, this felt like an endless feud in a Texas death match. Uh, and I believe, I, I don't believe, I know this was the last we saw of Fuji and Saito at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, I mean, if the, their time was up, they'd have been around in well over a year at this point. Like a year and a half, exactly. All right, I'll tell you what, uh, let's go. However, we are about to be, a couple of days after this, those that watch WWF television are about to be treated to something that they never thought they'd see on television, a Tiger Mask Mr. Saito match. Yeah, and that was one of the best matches that I had ever seen on television at that point. Yeah, that that was phenomenal, especially the bump that uh, Saito takes over the top rope down to the floor. And the dive Tiger Mask did on Mr. Saito was phenomenal. Right, follows it right up. That that dive, we, they never had anything like that on WWF TV before that. I mean, we saw it at Madison Square Garden, but this was the live, well, not live, but, you know, this is the the, the regular TV show. Yeah, I I had seen better matches on from other programs. I I'd, I'd seen better matches on Florida TV like Mike Graham against Dory Funk Jr., but this was by far the best match I had ever seen on WWF TV and I'd been watching over almost 7 years by now. I mean, we had seen better angles and you know things along those lines, but just pure technical matches. We never saw anything like this. Closest thing was that Buddy Rose Kurt Hennig match. I think that came after. Uh, I think it's before. You, I, I right, think right. that's. I think that's back um, during the summer at some point. All right, and let me see. Okay, so I'll tell you what. Let's do one more Buddy Rogers corner uh, with Fred Blassie and his new charge, Ray Stevens. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. At this particular time, believe me, it takes a lot of nerve for me to bring on my two guests. Really, they're not guests by choice. And I don't think I even have to mention their names because you know who they are. First of all, I'd like to know what you got on your mind, Mr. Blassie. Listen, if it's so repulsive to have us on here, you can leave any damn time you want to. And let Ray Stevens tell you what he thinks of you and your Jimmy Snooker. Ladies and gentlemen, before I go into that, I would like to say one thing. The two most unscrupulous matches I've ever seen in my life were performed by this gentleman right here. The one man, till this day, never wrestled again and suffers, believe me, an awfully lot. But the second guy that he tried to do it to, thank God it didn't work. Our boy Jimmy's still around, and I can't wait to you, Ray Stevens, are in that same position. Maybe you'd like to say something. Well, I'll tell you right now, <clears throat> Mr. Rogers, it is your pleasure for us to be out here number one. I mean, we don't care about your feelings or anything else. And as far as you see in my neck get put in that position, I don't think that you'll ever see anybody that's hoarse enough to put my neck in that position. I don't know about that. Wait a minute. I still think that when you get in that ring with our boy Jimmy, he's going to do a number on you like you never seen before. What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Listen, Listen let me it. tell you something else. Jimmy Snooker, Lou Arbano was doing fine with Jimmy Snooker. He was a good manager. He manages money. He can't help it if he's a dummy out of the jungle well, and don't know nothing about money. Come on, money. Ray. Come on, Fred. This bum, sleazy, slimy Rogers. Get you out of the way. Shake. Get out of the you way. Take, take a walk, you bunch of bum. Take a walk. Take a walk. Your day will come. Your day will come. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll go back to ringside. Thank you. Lou Albano doing a run-in on Buddy Rogers' corner. I, I didn't appreciate Lou Albano as much as I should have uh, during this time, Jamie. No, oh, no, he he was pure gold. I mean, his entire time, I I loved. I hated Albano, but I loved Albano. 
if that makes any sense. It, it does. I, I hated him too, even though I was a fan of the heels, but I just didn't appreciate his his shtick enough. It took me years to be like, oh my God, this guy was absolute gold. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's still the highlight for me is when he went Japanese. Absolutely. <laughs> the, the, those interviews were, you know, better than when he went Moondog, better than when he went, you know, Samoan. When he went Japanese, that was his best stick yet. But what I liked out of that Rogers corner, Buddy didn't take no crap. He stood right up to the three of them. Tell him how he feels. And I like what Fred Blassie had to say that, oh, if you don't like it, you can get up and get the hell out of here. That was great. <laughs> Bunch of arguing old men. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like you and I are now. There we, there we go. Except I think they were younger. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, once again, for review and educational purposes only, we have one last interview. It is with Bob Backlund. This one actually isn't from Buddy Rogers Corner. Let's hear from Bob now. This is Cal Rudman with the Golden Boy Arnold Skolin and the just victorious Bob Backlund defeating Buddy Rose. How does it feel? Oh, it feels really good, you know, to get a victory over this man, uh, especially the way all the people were responding and that support, you know what that means to us. Behind you, we uh, had a big crowd here tonight, too, an amazing crowd. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to explain to the people out there that uh, have never wrestled before, but Arnie knows how it feels when those people get behind you and they support you and they give you that extra adrenaline. And I was a little down tonight, but boy, when they get behind you and they really fire you up and they give you that extra energy. Well, let me tell everybody what you did it with. This is the first time that you have won a match at the Spectrum with your bread and butter hole the chicken wing and uh, what really made the chicken wing work was your cross face hold uh, do you want to explain exactly what happened there well a chicken wing is uh, pressure on the shoulder but when you cross face them uh, when you get those hands locked it's virtually I don't think uh, anybody can get out of it and Arnie's been wrestling for a long long time and uh, we perfected that hold he helped me with it and uh, I uh, I got this man to thank for that hold, and I, uh, I really appreciate everything Arnie does for me uh, every day. Something. Well, uh, Cal, let me say one thing. I mean, you can teach somebody something, but uh, if you don't have a, a fellow like Bob Backlund, who's in such terrific condition, no matter if you know a hole, but Bob is in such terrific condition. He works out uh, regularly every day, and he's in such fine condition that if he ever gets that hold on you, brother, it's all over. Well, I can give testimony to that. Just before we went on the air, you congratulated him in the absolute heat of the battle and the sweat pouring out of him about how he locked his fingers in. Do you want to explain that to the audience? Well, that's something we've been working on for a long time. And he, that. Just, just what happened. Well, we, we, don't, we just don't want to show everybody how we do these no, no, things. No, no, how he slid the fingers in. That's he, he just got them, hooked them in good and tight, and he just cinched up on that chin. This, this is the rest This of the is the one. Yeah. Rip like that. Yeah, that's okay. the way that's what, uh, and he's such a fine athlete, Cal. I just don't want to boast in front of him because well, he is. I, I'm a witness to that. But, uh, he is a great athlete in tremendous condition. I've seen many where I've wrestled many world champions, and I don't think I've ever seen any of them in as fine a condition as Bobby is. And he knows wrestling inside and out. Now, there is, uh, to tell you exactly what happened, you didn't just go into the chicken wing. You set him up. Uh, you did the arm stretcher hold. Uh, do you want to explain why you did that? and why it was necessary. The chicken wing has uh, been my bread and butter, and uh, I'm trying to weaken his arm, get him in a position to get him in that hold, and uh, it makes it a little easier when he's tired, uh, when you got his arm wore down a little bit. And, uh, when you get a man, a weak spot on a man, whether it's leg, his leg or his arm or his head, you try to stay on it and uh, wear him down and wear him down, and maybe you're going to sneak something on him. And tonight it was a chicken wing. Yeah, now he got five quick, big elbow smashes in a row. How badly stunned were you? Oh, he had me going pretty good there. I, um, I must admit, uh, I got You know, you can't uh, judge uh, the book. The book by its cover. That's your yeah. favorite saying. You got to read through it, and uh, you look at this man, uh, and you wouldn't think he could do what he can do in that ring. But I respect that man. Yeah, he's very agile. Yes, he is. And uh, you know, Cal, I got a tough one coming up here in the Philly area. A real tough one. Uh, what is that? I've got. Uh, we just signed a match with um, Don Morocco. Yeah. Well, and, okay. uh, tell me about you know, that. We, uh, He's a man that uh, I've wrestled him before, and uh, geez, he's tough. And we're we're looking forward to a heck of a wrestling match. And uh, I know Arnie respects him. We don't care for some of the things he does or some of the things he says. But boy, when we get in the ring against him, we, like, we know we got our hands full. And we know we got a few surprises for Don Morocco too, because we've wrestled him before. So we're going to go about it a different way this time. Well, wait. Let's go into this a little bit more. Uh, you say this very low key. You've wrestled him before. Now the truth of the matter is. I believe it was in Madison Square Garden. 
they tell us it's the toughest match you've ever had and the worst beating that you've ever endured the most pain would that be close to the truth yeah you know sometimes uh, you can win the win the battle but you don't really win the war sometimes you win the match and you get hurt worse than your opponent but how badly hurt were you there I was, uh, I, he had me going pretty good and uh, boy, boy, I uh, hung on and hung on but um, you know every time I get in the ring with him like I say I have my hands full and but uh, all these people around here have been supporting us. Oh, they're really team. behind you. The energy, um, the crowd was magnificent. I, got, I can't thank them enough for uh, for everything they've done for me, and uh, um, I can I try to train hard and work out hard and do my best in the ring, just for those good people out there. Well, I had told you uh, when we first came in tonight, we both got here early. You get here very early to work out, and uh, the kids wanted autographs. So as I signed each one, I asked them who their favorite wrestler was, and hey, the only way to take a survey is to do it. And I told you, I was a little surprised, but kid after kid after kid uh, chanted your name. And I know you're grateful for well, that. Well, I, uh, I love the kids, and uh, I try to help the kids as much as I can and deal with them as much as I can. Uh, um, they're going to be the leaders of this country someday. They're going to run the country, and we've got to help the kids all we can. Well, speaking of kids and Bob Backlund, I must say this to the audience. Number one, uh, the wrestling program that you run in the New York area for kids, which we discussed in an interview that I did with you, was just unparalleled. And second of all, uh, when I was co-host and enter chairman, ent entertainment chairman of this year's Arthritis Telethon, you were kind enough to come all the way down from home, and we broke the record over $800,000, and that came in on Channel 17 here in Philadelphia, where championship wrestling uh, is seen. And I can't tell you uh, how grateful everybody is, because there are a lot of little kids suffering from arthritis. And what you did there is just, just amazing. Well, thank you very, very much, Cal. I, uh, I appreciate all your nice comments. And uh, Well, you've got to get the credit for it because you well, do let it. Let me tell you one thing, uh, Cal. He's a little humble, you yes, know. He, he, not, he didn't just do that, and he just doesn't help the kids uh, for the wrestling team. But he visits a lot of hospitals and homes for the old people, and he really, with the veterans and everything, he consumes a lot of his time helping people and talking to children and everything. I've been with him on a numerous occasions and when he walks into a room he just electrifies the whole room well as a matter of fact i took bob personally to children's hospital here in philadelphia and we went on every floor in every ward and he just as you said electrified the entire hospital he sure does he's, he's a, a great person i hate to say it in front of but he he really is a, a he helpful to anybody that he can do anything for okay uh, when is that match going to be now with morocco do you know Okay. It's Congratulations to you. We've run much. out of time. Thank you very, very okay. much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, too. Bye. Jamie, you and I have talked in the past about the demise of Bob Backlund, and I have defended his interviews. You know, he did the same type of interview you would get from a Wayne Gretzky or a Joe Montana, but I mean, that, that was bad. I mean, I give Cal Rudman a lot of credit for at least kind of salvaging, salvaging that a little bit. Yeah, he, he tried. I mean, uh, that's the most I've ever heard Arnold Scullin speak. He carried most of the interview. The, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the title match that they were referring to was actually on December 27th. They ran a show in University City. I'm going to guess they probably held it at the University of Penn Ice Rink. And uh, Morocco beat back on uh, by count out. And that was Morocco's first house show is it, back on the circuit. Isn't Penn University in Philadelphia? Yes. So they they were running that and the Spectrum? Yeah, they, they ran the Spectrum, what, earlier in the month? Oh, wow. I had no idea. And, and then they, uh, or no, I could be, I'm just taking a, a quick glance here. They didn't, uh, they didn't run the Spectrum in, the, in December. They just ran this one show at University of the City. Then they re returned to the Spectrum. All right, that could have. I'm going I'm to bet they were probably opening the uh, the University of Penn's ice rink or something. That's why they held the show there. Plus, over the holidays, every year, uh, Disney on Ice or the Ice Capades always had the uh, Spectrum booked up during that time. All right, that explains it, because I was thinking, okay, that's probably a Sixers slash uh, Flyers thing, but you're right, you know, Ice Capades right around the holiday. Jamie, I want to thank you for being the, the guest here on Stick to Wrestling for the past two weeks. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. 
I'm around anytime you need me, John. Well, thank you for that. I want and thank you for having me. Oh, hey, you're you're perfect for this kind of show, man. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Brian Last for giving Stick to Wrestling a forum on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all the great work he does, and I want to thank everyone for listening. We'll be back next week. That's pretty much it. Thank you for listening. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Go Vols. This concludes our podcast day. Thank you.